service. I'm Super John Hin Suan. The weather in many parts of Thailand is expected to return to normal Wednesday after a tropical storm gammy weekends. However, experts and academics are refuting speculation that a storm surge will hit Thailand. However, another typhoon, another storm, soon to be typhoon, expected to head towards Japan, still has a chance to change path to Thailand. Professor Seri Soparatit of Rangsit University's Natural Disaster Studies Center told Thai PBS that Prapirun Storm, which has now been upgraded to a tropical storm near the Philippines, is likely to become a typhoon and head towards the Japanese islands a few weeks from now. However, there is a chance that the typhoon may change course and head towards Southeast Asia. If so, that typhoon will have the potential to drench many parts of this region. Both Professor Seri and the Meteorological Department rejected speculation by Science Minister and Head of the Government's Water Management Team, Prabha Sopsura Sawadi, that a storm surge could occur from Gami. The storm surge is an offshore rise of water associated with a low-pressure weather system, typically by typhoons or cyclones. The Meteorological Department's Director General, Sun Chai Bai Muang, said Gami is moving in a westerly direction towards Nakhambatom, Kanchanaburi, and finally, the Andaman Sea without moving into the Gulf of Thailand. More downpours from low-pressure cell Gami is still expected tomorrow, what will, but will disperse by Wednesday. On top of rain, the Met Office is now also closely monitoring a possible cold spell coming down from China next month. And despite the Met Office saying Thailand's weather is expected to turn, return to normal soon, eastern Bangkok remains of concern as water from downtown is being drawn east. The Sansat Canal is 40 centimeters higher than its normal level. Houses already flooded will see a further depth increase of 5 centimeters. The eastern part of Bangkok remains at risk of flooding for the next 10 days as water is already being retained in low-lying areas. Provinces in eastern Thailand remain on red alert for possible floods from the Gani storm. Some areas of eastern Thailand, like Prachinburi, will have to wait for at least two more months before the water level is back to normal. As we speak, Gami is slowly moving towards western Thailand. Upper southern Thailand can expect massive amounts of rain in two to three days from now. Meanwhile, the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration, or BMA, confirmed that it has indeed placed sandbags in the sewer system near Sinakarin Road to contain the water and pump it away from the Sinakarin Road. This is believed to accelerate the water drainage efforts. While Prom Prongnopurit, spokesperson of the Pua Thai Party, and officials from the Department of Special Investigation, or DSI, have called for the removal of those sandbags. Mom Raja Wong Sukhumpan Baripat, Bangkok governor, said that any movement of those sandbags without the PM BMA's approval is a violation of Article 266 of the Constitution, which prohibits political intervention in the work of permanent civil servants. The volume of rainfall last night was estimated to be 40 to 60 millimeter per hour, and the BMA will continue to monitor the rainfall throughout tonight. And moving on to politics, at least six politicians have a shot of becoming the new leader of the ruling Pua Thai Party this October 30th. Prime Minister Ying Lak Shinovar is also one of the party executives who could turn party leader. Police General Wirot Bao In is one of the six Pia Thai party acting deputy leaders. He is also seen as one of the five people suitable to become party leader, considering his seniority and experience from his involved in Thai politics for many decades. While well, after a 2000 coup brought down the real party leader and former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, Chaturon Chai Sang became acting leader of the now defunct Thai Rak Thai party. As a loyal member of this political grouping, Chaturon also has a chance to become chosen as a new Pua Thai party leader. While Pum Tham Wei Chia Chai, a Pua Thai executive who drafts political plans for the party, as well as Air Chief Marshal Sukampon Suwanathat, the Defense Minister, and one of Thaksin Shinawat's most trusted friends, both have chances of becoming Pua Thai leaders. Jaru Pong Rin Suwan, Acting Party Secretary General, and as a senior member of the party who is one of Prime Minister Ying Lak Shinawat's most trusted colleagues, also has a shot at the leadership. Alternatively, the Prime Minister could become her own party's leader. In the next 20 days, the name of the new leader will become clear. Additional clarity is also expected on whether the party stands on adjusting their game plan to reduce the chances of being dissolved as a result of numerous lawsuits in 
is in response to an order from an influential figure now residing outside of Thailand. Next Tuesday, the National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission, or NBTC, will auction off Thailand's third generation, or 3G, spectrum. Back in 2010, the predecessor of the NBTC, which is the National Telecom Commission, also attempted an auction to the licenses, but was ordered to suspend the process after state-owned Cat Telecom and the TOT filed a lawsuit with the administrative court against the commission just one day before the bidding took place. History might repeat itself this year. Here's more with Kun Bandit Bandit in Economic Focus. Thank you, Kun Subaton. Exactly as you said, tomorrow the National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission, or NBTC, will announce the names of the companies that will be allowed to bid for Thailand's third generation, or 3G spectrum. The actual auction will be held next Tuesday, October the 16th. However, Anupab, Tiralab, an independent telecommunications expert, said that the rules for the auction lack important details covering the protection of consumer rights and a six-count lawsuit is to be filed with the administrative court this Wednesday. The suit includes a demand that the auction be suspended. The first count concerns the 3G coverage rollout plan. The NBTC's bid rules require that 50% of the country have access to 3G in the first two years, increasing to 80% within four years. This will mean that those living in the more remote areas of the country will not have access to the 3G services. Anupap said that in Japan, for instance, 3G coverage was mandated to cover 100% of the country within the first two years. The second count concerns the quality of service and the reliability signal reception. The expert argued that the NBTC should specify that the license holder must provide 3G services at the highest possible standards allowed by the existing technology. Instead, the NBTC is requiring only the lowest standards. Additionally, the NBTC did not cap or control the service fees that telecommunications companies can impose on their customers or the level of compensation their service providers must provide in the case of network disruption or failure. More importantly, perhaps, the NBTC did not draft a standard consumer contract for services to ensure consumer rights protection or indicate how the revenue generated from the auction will be used to benefit the public. Executives of the NBTC, however, insist that the 3G spectrum auction follows the NBTC's model scheme and claim that damage will be done to the country if the auction is not held on October 16th. The government's rice pledging scheme, which guarantees to buy crops at way above the market weight, incentivizes the smuggling of rice from neighboring countries to Thailand for arbitrage, especially in Sakgao province, which is located next to Cambodia. Here, 30 cases of smuggling have been detected since the start of the program a year ago, an activity valued at about 3 million baht. This 180 tons of unmilled jasmine rice, which belongs to Pitai Kanasuk, an owner of a rice trading station in Sakgao province, was seized, la was seized on last Tuesday by the Internal Security Operations Command, or ISOC, after the authorities had investigated the smuggling of rice from Cambodia for more than a month and discovered that the crop was being traded at Pichai's compound. The owner, however, said that he purchased these crops from farmers and was not aware of their origin. The ISOC authorities discovered that villagers and investors who are owners of rice trading stations, transport crops in farm and pickup trucks, passing through over 20 checkpoints along the 165 kilometer long border. The smuggling activities are usually undertaken at night. Additionally, it is interesting to note that in some districts of Sakyao province, there is not much farmland and no rice mills, but new rice trading stations are being built every year, and at the moment, there are, new, there are seven new warehouses. It is thought that the high rice pledging prices have encouraged rice traders to smuggle crops from neighboring countries for sale here. Most smuggled rice is then transported to the central and the northeast regions. Oi Chai Kun Thip Montri, the senior customs of the excise official in Aranya Prathet of Sakgao province, said that since the government's introduction of the rice pledging scheme last October, the customs office has had to handle an increase in rice smuggling activities. Sources in the area noted that preventing the smuggling of rice from neighboring countries is difficult as the illicit activity is heavily organized and in which some state authorities are believed to be involved. 
And that wraps up tonight's economic news. Now back to Kun Subutun for the rest of the program. Thank you, Kun Mandit. A woman was confessed to killing and then decapitating her husband while he was asleep. She told the police that she was on drugs at that time. Surit Hon Di Pao has been arrested for allegedly murdering her husband, Prasit Si Sombun, at their apartment in Bangkok's Bang Kun Non district. Psychiatrists say Surit Hon's mental health has been affected by the long-term misuse of causing her to become paranoid about people around her, narcotics. However, she told police she killed and cut off her husband's head, hands, and one foot because she repeatedly scolded her for not working and insulting her parents. She stuffed her late husband's body into a suitcase and then asked a security guard to carry it downstairs. It was only when the curious guard opened the bag to see the body parts of the decapitated Prasit that what had happened to it become apparent. The husband's head was thrown into a local canal but later retrieved by authorities. Police have sent the accused for psychological assessment at a hospital to see if she is genuinely, genuinely mentally ill. If doctors find she is normal, she will be remained in custody to await trial. And a Thai man wanted for murder in Japan has finally been caught after almost two decades on the run. 39-year-old Wirasak Iampongsa, a former bar worker admitted before media in Bangkok today that he stabbed Megumi Awaji, a Japanese national, to death in her room in Tokyo in March 1993. It was a request from the Japanese government that started the determined search for him that ended with his arrest on a bus yesterday in the southern province of Nakwazi Tamarat. Mirasa killed a 33-year-old woman in a flat which he shared with her in Japan after she had been angry after losing money in a card game and had turned on him, insulted him, and spat at him. Mirasa claims the Japanese woman had thrown a knife at him, which he picked up and confronted Megumi Awaji in the bedroom where she insulted him again. He said after the woman knocked his hand away, the knife fell on the bed, both tried to grab it, but Mirasa was quicker. He said he was so angry, he stabbed her to death and flew back to Thailand the next day, taking many of her belongings with him. He will face a charge of premeditated murder under the Thai judicial system, and Thailand and Japan do not have a mutual extradition agreement. And finally today, Myanmar's opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi declared her willingness to serve as her country's president and her party's intention to amend the constitution to allow her to do so. Suji said at a news conference that it is her duty as leader of her National League for Democracy to be willing to take the executive office if that is what the people wanted. Myanmar's next election is in 2015. She said that she is a leader of a political party. As a political party leader, she also has to have the courage to be president and if that is what the people want, she will do so. Responding to a record, reporter's question, she said a clause in the Constitution effectively barring her from the job is one of the several her party seeks to change. Last week, Suji returned to Myanmar from a 17-day trip to the United States where she was treated as a hero of democracy. Myanmar's reformed president, Tian Sien, also visited the U.S. last month. Tian Sien, a former general, was elected to parliament in a 2010 election and launched a process of political reforms after taking office last year, after almost five decades of repressive military rule. In interviews, the public statements in the United States, Tian Sien made clear he had no intention of turning back from the democratic path. Su Ji's party had boycotted the 2010 polls because it just its judged several aspects of the election law unfair and undemocratic, but agreed to run in by elections earlier this year after Tian Sien's party had the laws amended. However, Su Ji's party still wants to change several clauses in the constitution that it also considers undemocratic. And that's it for Thai PBS English News Service. I'm Super John Clint Swan saying goodnight for now. Sorry, Cap. Thank you.